and this is your lesson for Wednesday. We're going to pick up with chapter oh man, 62 is what I'm trying to say. Um, I will apologize now. Some of these chapters are pretty long and some of them are quite short. Um, but there is the unfortunate part that um, no matter where we stop at any point, it's going to be a cliffhanger. So I'm going to just apologize now. Um, we'll be finishing the book here very shortly though. Chapter 62, Leave. The detonators are hidden in a sock in the back of his cubby. Anyone who finds them will think they're band-aids. He tries not to think about it. It's Blaine's job to think about it and to tell him when it's time. Today, Leave's unit of tithes are taking a nature walk to commune with creation. The pastor who leads them is one of the more self-important ones. He speaks as if every word out of his mouth were a pearl of wisdom, pausing after each thought as if he expects someone might write it down, want to write it down. He leads them to an odd winter bear tree. Leave, who is used to winters with ice and snow, finds it odd that the trees in Arizona still lose their leaves. This tree has a multitude of branches that don't quite match, each with a different bark and a different texture. I wanted you to see this, the pastor says to the crew. It's not much to see now, but oh, you should see it in the spring. Over the years, many of us have grafted branches from our favorite trees to the trunk. He points to the various limbs. This branch sprouts pink cherry blossoms, and this one with huge sycamore leaves. This one fills with purple hydrangea flowers, and this one grows heavy with peaches. The tithes examine it, touching its branches cautiously as if it might be a little moment to turn into it the burning bush. What kind of tree was it to begin with? asks one of the tithes. The pastor can't answer him. I'm not sure, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is what it's become. We call it our little tree of life. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? There's nothing wonderful about it. The words are out of Leave's mouth before he even realizes he's spoken them, like a sudden, unexpected belch. All eyes turn toward him. He equally recovers. It's the work of man, and we shouldn't be prideful, he says. When pride comes, when then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Uh, yes, says the pastor. Proverbs 11, isn't it? Proverbs 11, too. Uh, very good. He appears simply humbled. Well, it is pretty the spring. <laughs> Their path back to the tithing house takes them by fields and courts where the terribles are being observed and brought to the best physical, best possible physical condition before their unwinding. The tithes endure occasional jeers and hisses from the terribles like martyrs. It's as they pass one of the dormitories that Lee finds himself face to face with someone he never expected to see again. He finds himself standing in front of Connor. Each is heading in a different direction. Each sees each other at the same instant and stops short, staring in absolute shock. Leave? Suddenly, the pompous pastor is there, grabbing Leave by both shoulders. Get away from him! The pastor snarls at Connor. Haven't you done enough damage already? Then he spirits Leave away, leaving Connor standing there. It's all right, says the pastor, his protective grip on Leave's shoulders still firm as they stride away. We're all aware who he is and what he did to you. We were hoping you wouldn't find out he was at the same harvest camp, but I promise you, Leave, he will never harm you again. And then he says quietly, he's being unwell this afternoon. What? And, and good riddance, too. It's not unusual to see tithes unsupervised on the grounds of Happy Jack, although they're usually in clusters, or at the very least, groups of two. It's rare to see one hurrying alone, almost running across the fields. Leave hadn't lingered long once he got back to the tithing house. He took the first opportunity to slip out. Now he searches everywhere for Blaine and May. Connor is being unwound this afternoon. How could this have happened? How did he get here? Connor was safe at the graveyard. Did the Admiral throw him out, or did he leave on his own? Either way, Connor must have been caught and brought here. The one thing Leave had taken comfort in, the safety of his friends, has now been torn away. Connor's unwinding must not be allowed, and it's in Leave's power to stop it. He finds Blaine in the grassy commons between the dining room and the dormitories, being put through a regiment of calisthenics with his unit. Blaine does them oddly, putting a little, as little force into them as possible, making all of his moves low impact. I need to talk to you. Blaine looks at him, surprised and furious. What? Are you crazy? What are you doing here? 
A staffer sees him and makes a beeline toward them. After all, everyone knows tithes and terribles do not mix. It's all right, Leave tells the staffer. I know him from home. I just wanted to say goodbye. The staffer reluctantly nods his approval. All right, but make it quick. Leave pulls Blaine aside, making sure they're far enough away that no one can hear. We're doing it today, Leave tells him. No more waiting. Hey, says Blaine. I decide when we do it, and I say not yet. The longer we wait, the longer we risk going off by accident. So randomness works, too. He wants to hit Blaine, but he knows if he does, they'll probably leave a crater in the field 50 yards wide. So he tells Blaine the only thing he knows for sure will get him to give in. They know about us, whispers Leave. What? They don't know who it is, but they know there are clappers here. I'm sure they're reviewing the test blood tests right now, looking for anything unusual. It won't be long until they find us. Blaine grits his teeth and curses. He thinks for a moment, then starts shaking his head. No, no, I'm not ready. It doesn't matter if you're ready. You want chaos? Well, it's coming today, whether you want it or not. Because if they find us, what do you think they'll do? Blaine looks even sicker at the prospect. They'll detonate us in the forest? Or out in the desert where no one will ever know? Blaine considers it for a moment more, then takes a deep, shuddering breath. I'll find me. And tell her at lunch. Then we'll go at two o'clock sharp. Make it one. Leave rummages through his cubby, getting more and more frantic. Those socks have to be here. They have to be here, but he can't find them. The detonators aren't crucial, but they're cleaner. Leave wants it to be clean. Clean and quick. That's mine. Leave turns to see a toe-headed kid with the emerald green eyes standing behind him. That's my cubby. Yours is over there. Leave looks around and realizes he's off by one bed. There's nothing in the unit to identify one bed or one cubby from another. If you need socks, I can lend you. No, I, I've got enough of my own, thanks. <sighs> he takes a deep breath, closes his eyes to get his panic under control, and goes to the right cubby. The sock with the detonators is there. He slips it in his pocket. You okay, Leave? You look kind of funny. I'm fun. <laughs> Fine. I've just been running. That's all. Running on the treadmill. No, you haven't, says the kid. I was just in the gym. Listen, mind your own business, okay? I'm not your buddy and I'm not your friend. But we ought to be friends. No, you don't know me. I'm not like you, okay? So just leave me alone. Then he hears a deeper voice behind him. That's enough, leave. He turns to see a man in a suit. It's not one of the pastors, but the counselor who admitted him a week ago. This can't be good. The counselor nods to this tow-headed kid. Thank you, Sterling. The boy casts his eyes down and hurries out. We assigned Sterling to keep an eye on you and make sure you're adjusting. We are, to say the least, concerned. Leave sits in a room with the counselor and two pastors. The sock bulges in his pocket. He bounces his knee nervously, then remembers he's not supposed to make any jarring motions, or he might detonate. He forces himself to stop. You seem troubled, Leave, says the counselor. We'd like to understand why. Leave looks at the clock. It's 1248. Twelve minutes until he, May, and Blaine are supposed to meet and take care of business. I'm being tithed, Leave says. Isn't that enough of a reason? The younger of the two pastors leans forward. We try to make sure every tithe enters the divided state in the proper frame of mind. We wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't try to make things right for you, says the elder pastor, then offers a smile so forced it's more like a grimace. Leave wants to scream at them, but he knows that won't get him out of here any faster. I just don't like being around the other kids right now. I'd rather prepare for this alone, okay? But it's not okay, says the older pastor. That's not the way we do things here. Everyone supports one another. The junior pastor leans in. You need to give the other boys a chance. They're all good kids. Well, maybe I'm not. Leave can't help but look at the clock again. 12.50. May and Blaine will be in place in 10 minutes. And what if he's still here in this stinking office? Won't that just be great? You have somewhere you need to be? The counselor asks. You keep checking the time. Leave knows his answer needs to make sense, or they truly will become suspicious of him. I... I heard the kid who kidnapped me was being unwound today. I, I was just wondering if it had happened yet. 
The pastors look at one another and at the counselor who leans back in his chair as calm as can be. If he hasn't been, he will be shortly. Leave, I think it would be healthy for you to discuss what happened to you while you were being held hostage. I'm sure it was horrible, but talking about it can take away the power of the memory. I'd like to hold a special group tonight with your unit. It'll be time for you to share with the others what you've been holding inside. I think they'll find they're very understanding. Tonight, says Leave. Okay, fine. I'll talk about everything tonight. Maybe you're right and it will make me feel better. We just want to ease your mind, says one of the pastors. So can I go now? The counselor studies him for a moment more. You seem so tense. I'd like to walk you, talk you through some guided relaxation exercises. Chapter 63, Guard. Which would be nice if it scrolled. There we go. He hates his job. He hates the heat. He hates that he has to stand in front of the chop shop for hours, guarding the doors, making sure no one unauthorized enters or leaves. He had dreams back in Staho of starting a business with his buddies, but no one loans startup money to Staho kids. Even after he changed his last name from Ward to Mullard, the name of the richest family in town, he couldn't fool anyone. Turns out half the kids in his state home took on that name when they left, figuring they could outsmart the world. In the end, he outsmarted no one but himself. The best he could do was find a series of unfulfilling jobs in the year he'd been out of Staho, the most recent of which is being a harvest camp guard. On the roof, the band has started its afternoon set. At least that helps the time to pass a little more quickly. Two unwinds approach and both and climb the steps toward him. They're not being escorted by guards and both carry plates covered with aluminum foil. The guard doesn't like the look of them. The boy's a flesh head. The girl is Asian. What do you want? You're not supposed to be here. We were told to give this to the band? They both look nervous and shifty. This is nothing new. All unwinds get nervous near the chop shop, and to the guard, all unwinds look shifty. The guard peeks under the aluminum foil. Roast chicken. Mashed potatoes. They do send food up to the band once in a while, but it's usually a staff that carries the food, not unwinds. I thought they just had lunch. Guess not, said the flesh head. He looks like he'd rather be anywhere in the world but standing in front of the chop shop, so the guard decides to draw it out, making them stand there even longer. I'll have to call this in, he says. He pulls out his phone and calls the front office. He gets a busy signal. Typical. The guard wonders which he'd get in more trouble for, letting them bring the food in or turning them away if they really were sent by administration. He considers the plate in the girl's hands. Let me see that. He peels back the foil and takes the largest chicken breast. Go in through the glass doors, and the stairs are on your left. If I see you go anywhere but up the stairs, I'll come in there and trank you so fast you won't know what hit you. Once they're inside, they're out of sight, out of mind. He doesn't know that although they went into the stairwell, they never brought the food to the band. They just ditched the plates, and he never noticed the little round band-aids on their palms. Chapter 64, Connor. If it'll scroll. <laughs> Does this to me every time, doesn't it? Okay, it doesn't want to go scroll. Oh, it does. Ha 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 ha! Connor looks out the dormitory window, devastated. Leave is here at Happy Jack. How we got here doesn't matter. All that matters is that Leave will now be unwound. It's all been for nothing. Connor's sense of futility makes him feel like a part of himself has already been cut away and taken to market. Connor Lassiter! He turns to see two guards at the entrance. Around him, most of the kids have left the unit for their afternoon activity. The ones who remain take a quick glance at the guards and at Connor, then look away, busying themselves in anything that will keep them out of this business. Yeah, what do you want? Your presence is required at the Harvest Clinic, says the first guard. The other guard doesn't talk. He just chomps on chewing gum. Connor's first reaction is that this can't be what it sounds like. Maybe Reese has sent them. Maybe she wants to play something for him. After all, now that she's in the band, she has more influence than the average unwind, doesn't she? The Harvest Clinic? Echoes Connor. What for? Well, let's just say you're leaving Happy Jack today. Chomp, chomp, goes the other guard leaving. Come on, son, do we have to spell it out for you? You're a problem here. Too many of the other kids look up to you, and that's never a good thing at a harvest camp. 
so the administration decided to take care of the problem. They advance on Connor, lifting him up in the arms. No, no, you can't do this. We can and we are. It's our job. And whether you make it hard or easy, it doesn't matter. Our job gets done either way. Connor looks to the other kids as if they might help him, but they don't. Goodbye, Connor, says one, but he won't even look in Connor's direction. The gum-chewing card looks more sympathetic, which means there might be a way to get through to him. Connor looks at him pleadingly. It makes him stop chewing for an instant. The guard thinks for a moment and says, I got a buddy looking for brown eyes on account of his girls don't like the ones he's got. He's a decent guy. You could do a lot worse. What? Sometimes we get dibs on parts and stuff, he says. One of the perks of the job. Anyway, all I'm saying is I can give you some peace of mind. You know that your eyes won't go to some low life or nothing. The other guard snickers. Peace of life. Good one. Okay, time to go. They pull Connor forward, and he tries to prepare himself. But how do you prepare yourself for something like this? Maybe what they say is right. Maybe it's not dying. Maybe it's just passing from one for new form of living. It could be all right, couldn't it? Couldn't it? He tries to imagine what it would be like for an inmate to be led to his execution. Do they fight it? Connor tries to imagine himself kicking and screaming his way to the chop shop. But what would that be of any use? In his time on Earth, as Connor Lassiter is ending, then maybe he should use the time well. He should allow himself to spend his final moments appreciating who he is, was. No! Who he still is! He should appreciate the last breaths moving in and out of his lungs while those lungs are still under his control. He should feel the tension and release in his muscles as he moves and see the many sights of Happy Jack with his eyes and store them in his brain. Hands off me, I'll walk by myself, he orders the guards, and they instantly release him, perhaps surprised by the authority in his voice. He rolls his shoulders, cracks his neck, and strides forward. The first step is the hardest, but from that moment on, he decides that he will neither run nor dawdle. He will neither quiver nor fight. He will take this last walk of his life in steady strides, and in a few weeks from now, someone, somewhere, will hold in their mind the memory that this young man, whoever he was, faced his unwinding with dignity and pride. Comprehension questions? Discussion questions? You got it. Believe in you. Let me know if you have questions.